Thank you very much, Professor, and thank you to Thrombosis UK for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today. So, my name's Alison Wright. I was born in 1966, so I'm 49 years old. Um, oh, let's better do this. So, the first 30 years of my life, I was pretty healthy on the whole. I um, had a fairly standard education, went to university. From there, I joined IBM, where they picked me up in the milk grounds. Um, and then, because I've been to Botswana before, when I had been traveling, I wanted to go back. So I actually relocated to Botswana um, after having get, got to get some experience here. I've noted down that I've had a couple of car crashes. That's just to point out that I had some trauma. <laughs> <laughs> no, I must admit that the, the last one was me. I rolled my car, and that's when I thought, hmm, now do I want, am I doing what I want to do, or do, shall I go back to Botswana? And I went back there. So I joined um, an, an IBM dealership, and IBM thereafter bought it because we grew very rapidly. Um, I had a daughter, uh, oh, I missed out my son. He was born on the last page. <laughs> <laughs> He, um, it was a difficult birth, a long birth, 12 hours, and we used forceps. But I didn't have any problems, straight back to work afterwards. Um, and then my daughter was born, similarly, again, no problems, straight back to work afterwards. Unfortunately, my husband died when I was 34, so it made me re-evaluate. Re and when I went out to Botswana, I had kind of thought, well, I'll save for a master's and then come back and do a master's. So that's what I did. I actually came back to England, brought my kids home with me, uh, and went to Sussex University and did a Master's in Science and Technology Policy. Then I joined um, the University of Brighton and, and remarried. So everything was going pretty, pretty well there. I must have left out a DVT somewhere along the line. Ah, oh, yes, first DVT, age 33. So I had a big... Oh, I'm going to tell you about that. I've got a chart. First DVT. Um, the preceding event was a blunt force trauma to my back. Uh, no, it wasn't a car crash. No, <laughs> not this time. And then I had lower back pain for 10 days. Really, and I went to the GP. She advised that I rest. But then I had this sudden onset, whoomph, down my leg. Within half an hour, my leg had swelled up. It was cold, not hot, uh, purple, and incredibly painful. So we went to A&E, and... Um, at first, they were worried it might be in my heart arteries, the clot. So they did an arteriogram to rule out the clot in my arteries. Then they did a venogram, and they saw that it was in my calf and thigh and leading into my, into my pelvis as well. So then they did a CT scan so they could see the filling defects in my common iliac vein, etc. So, And they concluded that my clot had started in my pelvis, and I would agree with that, because that's certainly where I had the pain for the preceding 10 days. Um, I was later diagnosed with heterozygous factor V Leiden, and that's one of the reasons why I'm a clotter. Um, the treatment, this was in Botswana, they just treated me with bed rest. I had five days in the hospital on heparin, not allowed out of bed. That was gruelling. And that led to me getting constipation, which was almost as bad, because I had to go back to A&E almost as soon as I'd been discharged because of the constipation pain. So I'm just putting it there as a warning to, to you. Um, anyway, the outcome was great. It went back to normal. I never had any more pain. I never even thought about it again. Apart from when I travelled, I was careful when I was travelling to walk around and stuff. But when I got to the working with the University of Brighton, I had this accident. I call it the great accident. I fell, I was walking over that grate and, I, and it dropped into the hole. So I dropped with the grate into the hole. It was between my legs and I collapsed down hard, hitting my ischial tuberosity on the grate. And this caused an enormous amount of damage. I did initially try to go back to work, but, um, oh no, straight after the incident, 10 for, for a couple of weeks, I, mean, I had a lot of pain because I'd broken a toe in my foot and my hip was absolutely terrible. Um, but I also noticed this back pain had restarted. So I went to my GP and said, I recognize this back pain. I think I'm having a DVT again. He did a D-dimer in his clinic 
positive. He sent me, gave me some tablets straight away in an injection and then sent me off to Lewis Hospital, a local hospital for a scan. And the radiologist there found a clot that I had clotted in my iliac vein again. Um, treated with warfarin, same thing, it all cleared, no problem. Carried on with fixing the rest of the problems because I then in the next six years I had to deal with the pain, um, I had several operations. Uh, in the process, we found out I was allergic to some various things like PPD uh, and nickel. I did initially go back to work in pain, denying really the, the, the trouble that I was having, but it, it culminated in me having a panic attack and then I realized I really had to take, up, take time off and get better. So I've had a sequence of operations um, and through this time I've become depressed and very anxious. I would suffer from anxiety attacks regularly. So I've been taking duloxetine and para, uh, pre, pregabalin, which I found, pergabalin, which I found very good. Um, okay, so that's the next six years. Those are all the injections I had. Oh, and I've had complications such as I reject the sutures that they use, permanent sutures for one of the operations. I then rejected that and I've got some mesh in me and I'm rejecting that. So it really is carrying on and on and on. But I still really wasn't thinking much about DVTs because I had my the pain had gone. But then I did a, a long car journey. So this is now my third DVT. Um, it was supposed to be just a three-hour car journey, but the traffic was awful, and so I wasn't in the mindset of moving regularly and so on. And when I got out of the car at the end, I had terrible pain in my pelvis, and I knew I'd clotted again. Now, this time, unfortunately, I had some tins of parin available because, obviously, when I was going through all of those operations, every time I was picked up as high risk, so I was treated brilliantly th through all of those and, and, and never had a problem, but it did mean I had some tins. So I applied some tins of parent to myself, went to A&E the next day, um, and I had a hell of a time. First of all, triage, because I wasn't swelling, I was only got a well score of one. My leg wasn't swelling. so. There was an issue there. Then I had to wait, sit it, waiting for six hours before the doctor saw me. When he saw me, he gave me an injection and then told me to come back the next day for imaging. I went back the next day for imaging. First, they imaged my leg, and I said, well, it's no good imaging my leg, the clots in my pelvis. Went back later, had an image of my pelvis, and the radiologist found, well, she couldn't find my iliac vein, so she reported it as obscured. Uh, and as a result of that, when I went back to the doctor, he said, well, then it would appear that you, you do not meet the criteria for continued treatment. So go home, but keep an eye open for, for it. Now, I went out that night. It was Halloween. So I went to the pub. When I got back and was getting undressed, I realized that my leg was starting to swell. I bent down. It was vis physically very obvious. So I... By this time I'd drunk and my husband had had something to drink, so I then called 111. They sent an ambulance for me. Ambulance took me in. Busy night in A&E in Brighton, I can tell you, in some really garish outfits and very bloody people coming in. But uh, anyway, they kept me on the trolley for three hours and then the A&E manager came in and rearranged a few things. The next thing I knew, I was being thrown off the bed into a wheelchair taken back to the waiting room, where I then had to wait all night till six o'clock in the morning before I saw a doctor. And by then, my leg was just enormous. Anyway, then he gave me an injection, we treated it. But this clot has a, has a lasting impact. So my leg is now persistently painful and the flow's not good. And I've got persistent back pain now as well. So that, that pain that, that signified the clots for me is now constant. Um, and it's also left me feeling anxious about attending A&E when, when I am worried, which can occur you know, quite regularly. Okay, the fourth DVT was quite recently. Um, 
I um, <laughs> haven't used any of my notes there. The fourth DVT, I had... Um, it was a fight with the bramble, actually. I was back bramble picking, and I got caught up in the, in the long brambles and fell over. And unfortunately for me, I didn't know that my INR, because I'm now on warfarin lifelong, I didn't know my INR had dropped to one. So the next, I got a phone call from the clin warfarin clinic, because I'd had a test that morning. They phoned up and said, oh, you know, your, your INR's one. Do you have any clotting events going on? I said, well, actually, yes, in my, in my ankle. So she wanted me to go to A&E, but I went to my GP. He arranged the tinsaparin for me, and we did a treatment dose, treatment course of that for about a month. Um, I've still got the same pain swelling, and now I've got a sore ankle as well. So this, that's been my warfarin journey since uh, January, December, January. Um, I, I was stable, instable for quite a long time. This uh, failure occurred because I took an antibiotic. Now, we did know that the antibiotic was going to interact, but the, it, it, I wasn't being tested regularly enough to pick up the rapid decline in my INR. So some of the questions that I've got that I'd like answers to is... is um, that well score, it, it, does the well, well score adequately identify pelvic DVT risk? And I would argue not, because it misses, because you don't have the or evidence swelling, the obvious swelling um, that they're looking for when, you, when they're doing triage. Um, now, some trusts have, have been, NHS trusts have been trialling having fast track access to emergency diagnostics and imaging. And, uh, I'd really, really, really like that because it is, particularly now I have the sort of medical PTSD effect of really not being able to go there. I, I, I need some sort of fast track access because I can't take another six hours waiting. Um, and then I'm afraid, yeah, do radiologists always get it right? I know I've seen some research that actually says that radiologists get it wrong more than they get it right. I know there's lots of different research papers, but, but from my experience, and I've been through imaging quite a few times now, particularly around this, this pelvic region, they're not great at picking up the clots there. Not all of them. Um, oh, yes, and my, not visualising the vein means there's actually just no flow through it, so that's why you can't visualise it. Okay, and then with regards to treatment, I found it very difficult to, I had to ask to see the haematologist, I had to ask to see the vascular surgeon, I had to research to find out where I needed to go. Um, I think some of these things should be sort of an automatic, these, this is your team that's going to take care of you through your life. Uh, and where all the information goes, because I've, I've taken vitamin K once for some emergency surgery for another problem that I'm suffering from. Um, you know, the, the haematologist doesn't... It, it, it just feels like we're, we don't have anyone watching over us, basically. And then I'm also wondering whether we couldn't get some... Tiva, who sell this um, warfarin, couldn't they donate some home monitoring equipment, perhaps, so that we can monitor at home? Because I think that would give me a better um, outcome. Um, the other thing is that I'm having foot problems. Um, and one of the things that worries me is that uh, ulcers are a real possibility further down the line, or at least from my family history, I know that <coughs> ulcers are a problem down the line. And I'm worried that we're not taking well enough care of feet at this stage. Um, oh, yes. And I feel like... I mean, I've done my exams and my masters, etc. I feel like I've... Over these last six years, I, I really feel that I could sit some exams now on everything I've learnt about uh, the musculoskeletal system of the body and the hips and everything. I was wondering whether there was some kind of lifelong learning qualification that, that we could have running alongside chronic patients that are going to be dealing with something like this for a lifetime. 
so that also their knowledge is recognized by the medical profession. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I hate to say it, spending the money. Cost? Cost. Because I now don't work. I'm not even getting benefits because this doesn't seem to count for DWP. So it's you, cost. So if you could have a machine, you would be willing to self-monitor? Oh, definitely. So there's a, it's only one from Roche in the audience. <laughs> so, yeah, I was... Um, Trees that your initial DBT and subsequent ones seem to be linked to trauma, particularly to your hip area. That um, sort of called me because after crunching my coccyx on a rock in a skiing accident, I had DBTs throughout my left leg also. Yeah. You. Um, remember this? Is this a link between trauma to skeleton? And well, yeah. it's just trauma generally. Yeah. yeah. But, but also, I'd say it's because of the position that it is, because right behind where you're talking about is where you have the iliac artery crossing the iliac vein. I think your point about uh, the well score and abdominal uh, clots is well taken. I think generally we think that the clot starts in your lower leg and goes up. No. That's not always the case. No. Yeah, I was told Mine went it, down. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I was told it couldn't be connected because, yeah, it's upstream of the leg. Hmm. Quick, 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 quick. No, 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 I, I have one of the machines, so I've been a lot of sacrifice and um, got one myself. Um, and my, I'm from Edinburgh, Scotland, and it's lovely. Well, we've got all that again, it's okay. <laughs> and I've had quite a lot of discussion with both hematologists, GPs, um, and there is a bit of uh, uncertainty about it because they feel that maybe someone who's been a bit more anxious about it might be testing every day or every week and it just adds some patient anxiety. Um, mm. So my, my GP surgery still. Yeah, but that's part of the education, isn't it? Yes. If, if you're going to self monitor, you need an education package, which means you don't deserve it. Eve, last, last comment or question. It's a comment or question. Have you got a machine for this young lady? Unfortunately, we haven't, okay. but just to say that Rochdale Diagnostics, who manufacture one of them, might be able to help you with that. Yeah. 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 And I've been telling them for years they should give them away anyway, because they might have money on the street. Yeah. However, thank exactly. you very much. <laughs> All right, thank you.